Yeah, hello and welcome to the Friday Show. I've got two great guests for you. Well, really three, because it's Christian Finnegan and Ophir Eisenberg joining me. Oh, Finnegan Fridays coming up. And first, I've got historian, author, and the brilliant Dr. Ruth Van Giat joining me. And I've got you. Thank you very much for listening and supporting me this week. Thank you for those of you who upgraded your subscriptions. Several of you did that this week, which was awesome. Thank you to new subscribers as well. Very excited to have all of you joining us as we build our community of thoughtful, curious, hilarious, awesome, amazing people. I mean, you might not be all those categories, but that's certainly the sense I get of you. Great hangout last night. As always, I'll pretend I already did it, but I'm recording this before. The Hangout in anticipation of it. Anyway, it was so much fun. It was great to have Vicky this week and have us at the hang- have her at the Hangout. Very, very cool. She's like her own little celebrity now, as many of you have become. Thank you to Pete Coe and Garrett Sever and John Carroll and everybody who contributed to the shows this week. But let's get to it, shall we? All right. Like I said, coming up, another a really great conversation with Christian and Ophir I think you're going to really like. But first, it's time to get to Ruth. Ben Giat, who is always great. You see her on CNN as a regular contributor. She's also a historian, a scholar at NYU. And you should check out her newsletter, Lucid. It's so great. She does so great work at Lucid. You should go subscribe to that. And, of course, follow her on Twitter, at Ruth Ben Giat. And, of course, her book, Strong Men, Mussolini to the Present. Definitely check that out as well. But right now, we get an update and learn more from Dr. Ruth Ben Giat. Thank you very much for joining me, Ruth. I really appreciate it. That was a pleasure. So I just wanted to start by asking you about these convoys. I think you've been doing great work talking and writing about them in terms of obviously how that this type of technique has played out historically, but also identifying kind of the different threads that have come together. It's kind of headlined as anti-vax, but it's really just the same, not same old because there's a lot of new anti-government, right? Yeah. Yeah, part, there's different strands coming together. Um, some of the people involved in, in the this is in Canada, um, like Tamara Lick, were um, they're far right activists who uh, she was involved in Wexit, which was the attempt to have secessionism of Western Canada, and then there are other people who are Islamophobes, um, conspiracy theorists, and so they they tried with a trucker protest in 2019. So now they've all glommed on to the anti-vax, anti, you know, mask mandate uh, protest, which has really, it has a lot of traction because it, it impacts people at a physical level and impacts their, you know, their families. And so they're going with it. So that's part of it. It's, it's a smokescreen for some of these far right activists, um, the whole anti-vax thing. It's convenient for them. How has how has uh, this kind of technique played out here or anywhere else in, in the world in the past? And I think most importantly, kind of the reaction to these types of strategies, these convoys of trucks blocking, in this case, uh, a bridge, the reaction to it really matters how it's handled by the government. Right. Yeah. So um, what of the today in my newsletter, Lucid, I have an interview with a um, Canadian extreme extremist expert. Yeah, I'm going to steal about, it. That's such a good interview. Everybody should be subscribing. I really liked it. Go ahead. Yeah. And, and it, it just dropped uh, today and it talks about she talks about how there was an absence of basic policing and that. Um, They let this thing grow and, you know, and that even just reinforcing what she called administrative law, where, you know, you say, well, you can't be blocking. You're going to lose your license if you keep blocking traffic, things that we wouldn't be. Nobody would put up with if we just sat there and blocked traffic. And yet these people are getting away with it. And her point as a, you know, somebody who studies extremism was that then it, it encourages and empowers others and they think that they can do it. And in fact, when when the police did go in and tell people to disband the encampments, they all complied with no violence. Mm. And 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 she also said that they were they acted amazed that the police were asking them to do anything because the police had been so passive. And, you know, Canada is a different policing environment than the United States. We we have a whole other dynamic with police. But. What the lesson is that doing nothing, it's always that with the far right. When you do nothing and you allow them to 
feel empowered, that's when movements can really grow. You write that in at Lucid, you write the transnational nature of the convoy movement is another sign of the influence of Trumpism in and outside the U.S. Trump flags can be seen at many Canadian events. Are you surprised by that? No, um, because, you know, again, Trumpism is for some people, it's it's heartfelt and others. It's a kind of um, way to broadcast their allegiance and. You know, with social media and also you, a lot of this is a GoFundMe, give, send, go. It's been possible to um, to create these huge communities around far right issues very quickly. And that's what happened with the convoy movement and uh, research by, you know, the NBC, Ben's Collins published also a lot of these some of these accounts, the anonymous accounts, they they were pro Trump accounts and then they became pro convoy accounts. Right. So the Trumpism and Trump represents a big tent for all kinds of extremists. That's why he's so dangerous um, and the GOP so dangerous because they're backing him. And um, so that makes sense that, you know, the, the Trump part is the continuity. So it makes sense that you'd see Trump flags there uh, up in Canada. One question that I have for you, I know it's fundamental, but it seems like Kind of the most important, these, uh, you know, autocrats and, and, and right wing insurgency that you write about has been embraced by the Republican Party. You say that they they, they uh, want to the, the point of them is to prove that democracy does not work and can't respond to crises. Uh, and and I alone can fix it kind of attitude. And yes, last night, Tucker Carlson, who you've written uh, a lot about said that Canada is no longer a democracy because the prime minister called for, you know, a state of emergency on these convoys. And so my question to you is they're not acting. They're not saying overtly that they're anti-democratic. They're not saying they're against democratic elections and democratic rules, but they are. What am I missing? Well, they're too smart to come out and say that because the history of um, anti-democratic actions uh, is always made in um, in defense of, quote, freedom, in de- defense of the rights of the people. And so e- there's even a whole line that, and it's even espoused by uh, China and Russia today, that they are the true dem- democracies, not the U.S. So words mean nothing to propagandists, and they will always put themselves, um, a- a- they will always situate themselves as the um, the merchants of freedom. In fact, look what happened with January 6th. It was a brutal, uh, violent action that was that was designed to shut down the operation of democracy. And instead, Trump and the GOP have made it into a, a freedom cause. It was defending freedom. So that's part of what goes on. And and, you know, of course, Tucker Carlson is going to say that using a state of emergency is a sign of authoritarianism, because that's part of I call it the upside down world of the far right, Mm. where people who are actually Democrats have to be seen as tyrants. Look at all the uh, the Fox News um, propaganda about Tucker, about Joe Biden as a despot and Joe Biden as a socialist dictator, which Mm. is all patently absurd. But that's what they do. Um, and, And it's very confusing to people and it's meant to be confusing to people. Wanted to ask you about another issue that you've written about, you wrote about in your book. Uh, it's about masculinity and how this yes. idea of masculinity is a tool of political legitimacy along with violence and corruption. I remember reading this uh, about, who was it, Mussolini, I think you write about this. Um, the leader is a man who gets away with sexual, financial and other crime. He's admired because of that and this is you're right you're tweeting about this as a result of uh, a report from the, the uh, council on foreign affairs the revenge of the patriarchs right yeah the, um this foreign affairs uh published a really good article by two political scientists talking about how autocrats um kind of suppress, you know, women's rights and turn on women. And it confirms many of the things I wrote in my book. Um, And, you know, a lot of scholars didn't want to take masculinity seriously. So actually my book was the first to 
give a whole chapter to machismo, putting it up there with corruption and violence and, and propaganda as a tool of rule, because it's, it's absolutely essential. And so if you think of the Trump cult, you know, in our, in our country, how he's a man above all other men, he's competent, I, can, I alone can fix it, but he's also um, admired for his lawlessness. And so authoritarianism is about lawlessness, so it's no accident We've seen this epidemic of kind of toxic masculinity um, and, you know, people like Madison Cawthorn and Josh Hawley and then Paul Gosar, who, you know, who tweets out a video showing AOC getting killed. And he's more popular with his base than ever. So you have this kind of lawless masculinity that intersects with violence and propaganda and that's that's what um, that's the field that we're writing about. And it's it's it needs to be taken seriously because it's it's easy to laugh at, you know, Putin taking his shirt off, doing his ice baths. But it's actually deadly serious. Yeah. So let's finally get to that, because clearly he is someone who personifies this technique in as many ridiculous ways as possible. Uh, but t- talk to me about where you think we are at here on what is it? The 16th we're talking and we're on the precipice of a p- potentially I- uh, imminent war in, in Russia, Ukraine. And so many of the, you know, Putin just personif- personifies so much of what you've written about and, and studied about, including as you just said, the, the patriarchy, the, the masculinity. But to some extent, some people think he's winning, that he's doing a good job. Certainly he's winning over a lot of American Republicans, which I think most of us never thought we would say because of many of those qualities. Right. Oh, absolutely. Um, he he's been there for 20 years, so he has plenty of he's had plenty of time to uh, get himself into a position where. Uh, it's he has enough power to do what he wants to do. Um, and he's always had invested a lot in his personality cult so that he can seem like the defender of Russia and the protector. And there's a huge there's been a huge, you know, Kremlin propaganda of Russia as victimized by the West and victimized by countries around it. And so uh, one of the things that's going on with the possible invasion of Ukraine is um, all of these strongmen, they they talk about making the nation great, you know, a better future, but they really specialize in the idea of making it great again. <laughs> and so for and that means something for everybody. You know, Mussolini had the Roman Empire and here Trump was like when, you know, non-whites couldn't vote and all of that. But for Putin, it's been like reviving the prestige of of the Soviet Union. And the idea of spheres of influence Um, and look at, you know, you have Belarus, the dictator Lukashenko is like his lackey. Right. And that's how it was. That's how it was then. And so this he's very popular in um, with some Russians for uh, the they see him as reviving the prestige and the power of Russia. And um, the issue is that sometimes these personality types you know, they create these like safe spaces for themselves. And Russia is a kleptocracy. And Putin has been very successful at legalizing kind of thievery for him and his oligarchs. But sometimes they get they start to believe their own propaganda, their own cults and their arrogance gets the best of them. And then they start overreaching. And sometimes that takes the form. I write about this in the last chapter of my book. It takes the form of embarking on these kind of imperialist ventures once in a while it works, but usually in the end, it it backfires. So like Idi Amin decided he was going to annex part of Tanzania and that and he wasn't there very long. So that was the end of him. So you could yeah, see with this. Putin, I mean, he's got Georgia in 2008, Crimea yeah. in, in what, 14 and now yeah. Ukraine. I mean, he seems to be winning. He also interfered in America's election and, and, and put us in an unstable position, which I think you also write about that, you know, yeah. uh, uh, Biden wants a stable relationship. And I think you were like, well, that's exact that, that's exact opposite of what Putin wants and what he's achieved. Yeah. And and I was very against the summit in the summer. Right. I thought it was a very bad idea. And I predicted that it would make Putin more reckless. And that's because, you know, autocrats don't negotiate. They, in fact, if you if you bring them into negotiation, they'll see you as weak. And so 
what they do is create these crises and then they exploit this crisis frame to either um, get concessions or to normalize like a prior crisis they've created, which would be, you know, annexing Crimea. So I don't know if he's going to back down. It's very hard for autocrats. They have to save face and, and Putin knows very well what he wants out of this. So I don't know what will happen, but it has um, proceeded according to the dictator's playbook for sure. Well, uh, the idea that Biden did kind of put him on an equal playing field. I mean, it's hard. I guess I want to ask you who's winning and, and, and who's losing in this situation, in this dynamic uh, to, to kind of feel like I can wrap my heads around, head around it. But it certainly does seem like I mean, I'm not sure if that's a fair uh, question to even be asking, but it, it does seem like Putin is getting a whole bunch of wins. Um, he's getting wins. And he has manipulated the situation very well until now. But one thing, for example, during this crisis, NATO is now much more united against him than it was before. There's also uh, more support now for doing what they all wish all of them, including the EU, should have done to deter him ages ago, which is go after his money. So I don't know what will happen, but um, you also have to look long term. And uh, there are many things that could come out of this that could weaken him internationally. And the other thing is he's doing all of this. He's getting more repressive because he's not getting any younger. And there you can never talk about a successor. So they back themselves into a corner um, that might not help or be relevant to Ukraine right now. But um, which is what matters right now. But it's it's it shows that he is feeling more. Ironically, it shows he's feeling actually uh, on the defensive that he has to do this move. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's the kind of a lot of the the uh, analysts uh, analysis that I've seen. And I, hopefully that's that's definitely the case. Final question. I saw this in your Twitter timeline. This idea about leaving America uh, if, if we are no longer a democracy. Just just uh, what is your answer to people who who get to that point? I've certainly felt that way at, at some times. Yeah, I wrote an essay for Lucid, like uh, I think I call it stay and resist or leave, <laughs> which is an unthinkable question for those of us in America. We never we never you know, figured we'd have to even entertain that in America is where other people came from bad situations to 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 have a little bit of peace here. But um, I, I don't recommend one thing or the other because it's highly individual uh, depends a lot on your circumstance. But. The, the, I wanted to kind of point out uh, how going into exile and and having these exile communities abroad has been something authoritarianism has produced because we don't pay enough attention. Every time these regimes come in, uh, sometimes it's hundreds of thousands of people like with Chile in 1973, uh, 200,000 Chileans left. Um, so, and they form communities all over the world. And so the fact that some Americans are thinking about this, um, and I get queries, people write me asking, you know, what should they do? It is a sign of our, like how, how, um, degraded our democracy has become. Such great points and all really important to be cognizant of. And I'm always so appreciative of your work, your scholarship, your newsletter, your Twitter timeline. And every time I get to ask you these questions directly, uh, you're doing such an important public service. I really appreciate it so much, Ruth. Thanks. That was a pleasure. There she goes, Ruth ben Giat. Get the book, Strongman, Mussolini to the Present. Watch her on CNN. Subscribe, most importantly, to her newsletter, Lucid. Follow her on Twitter at Ruth ben Giat, And thank her, please, for joining me here. And we learn so much from every time we talk to her. And always awesome. All right, let's have a little fun, cultural commentary, talk about life and the news and everything that we're dealing with as we do almost every Friday here on Stand Up. The Friday regular conversation with comedians Christian Finnegan and Ophira Eisenberg, who are both so brilliant, articulate, and thoughtful, and hilarious. You can see them both together in Stone Harbor, New Jersey, a Sunday night. It's like a Saturday night in southern New Jersey. Check them out there. Ticket show links in today's show notes. I was supposed to be there with them, but this is the first week of John Oliver taping, and I'm not working 
there every weekend. Every Saturday they tape, but this week it's going to be Sunday and then from there on Saturday. So if you ever want to go to John Oliver, I can't guarantee you tickets, but let me know if you're in New York City. And you want to go to a taping of last week tonight, because that's where I'll be spending my Saturday afternoon, early evenings, uh, most most Saturdays from here until, I don't know, I can pay for college. All right, here it is. Christian Finnegan, Ophira Eisenberg, right now. Christian Ophir Eisen again, no Christian Finnenberg. However, you slice them up, you get a different word. If you say it fast enough, you clearly sound absurd. When you say it louder, it sounds like they're real words. Christian Ophir Eisen again, no Christian Finnenberg. I don't think you're ready for what you haven't heard from Christian. But just so you know what I'm made of, he was like, well, what if it was for 50 bucks? And I was like, maybe I'd do it. Ah. <laughs> I mean, I'm not above it. I'm starting right there. Can we start there? We had no preamble. I think people should know that we haven't talked in two weeks and we still really haven't talked other than uh, Ophira's technical issues getting in. Yeah, because I can't learn how to use Chrome. How are we doing, folks? Great to see you both. I've missed you both. Missed you? Missed you went Peter. skiing, huh? Yeah, I was just talking about it with Christian that there were there were uh, some crashes that that happened with other people that I happened to be uh, watching. It was pretty it was pretty weird, but I don't want any oh. I, don't, I don't want people to be scared of skiing. That's why I don't talk about it. Yeah, well, I mean, it is scary. It's I mean, like, I mean you, you probably read it about is, it in the news. Right. Uh, yeah, that's all it was. Died. Did it you was, see uh, that video of the people stuck? A chairlift broke and there was a water main shooting up at them in freezing cold weather. Like it, and I'm not exaggerating. There was a, one of the snowmaker okay. hoses was shooting straight up at people <laughs> on a chairlift while it was freezing out they, and they couldn't do anything about it. That's fine. Oh my gosh. That's <laughs> you, I, Let me I think just, what category is that in? I don't care. That's yeah. Okay. I, I have this category weird. That is anti-skier bias yeah. that i've always had since being a kid just the the kids in my town who skied and i oh goodness, tried it really? once yeah i have a real negative feeling about skiers mm. like which is irrational i i admit is completely yeah. irrational is it because we're like so cool that's so, my, that yeah i mean i grew up in the rockies yeah well that that's the thing i i i, uh, I grew up in Canada the rockies and everyone skied okay you grew yeah, up what? thank you she's like behind us she's i like, mean yeah. i I know, I know, I'm behind you. I'm going to get up to speed. I have proper internet. I have everything should be right. And it's wrong. <laughs> I think everything you're I have right. is right. I, I, I think, have equipment. I have a computer. I have fast Wi Fi. I pay for everything. You're right. To the be world is wrong. Able you're to right. do this. The world is wrong. Thank you. Thank <laughs> um, you. I think finally, we might, I someone think, on the same page as me. I, I, I think we might get, uh, be caught up now. You grew up in Western Canada, so skiing was part of the culture, and, and Christian grew up in Massachusetts, where it, was, it still was. I mean, it's not like you didn't have winter there. A little bit. It was a culture among yeah. the un unlikable people. <laughs> <laughs> what? No, well, no, I do I do sincerely give a fear a pass. It reminds me of, like, I have the same feeling about golf. Like, I, I hate golf. I hate yeah. people who golf. I yeah. hate yeah. people who care about it. Yeah. And I know it's irrational. I know it's irrational. But when I was in, uh, I did Edinburgh a couple of years ago, the Fringe Festival, and, you know, obviously that's the, the birthplace of golf, Scotland. Mm -hmm. And people are just golfing. Like, like I saw two goth kids putting, which was hilarious <laughs> awesome. to me, like full goth regalia. And they're out there like, you know, practicing their, their putts. And, and that to me is, like, okay, clearly it, it, there's no uh, social uh, implications to being a golfer. And, you think, know, and I, same thing about skiing in Canada, I imagine. I get, I get turned off to, at this point in my life by, by sports or activities that don't seem very inclusive in terms of, you know, like skiing right now is completely unaffordable. If you don't have a season's yeah. pass, it's like yeah. $150 is like the cheapest, or, you know? And, and so who's, who's able to afford that for their family and then you go inside and you buy a sandwich for seven hundred dollars. So you better pack that lunch. So it's so like sports, uh, golf, te like a lot of things are just not that inclusive. And that I noticed that because I think I got to do everything. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it was still expensive. I mean, that was a, and I did not ski. So all of my friends skied because, mm. I mean, we literally were an hour away from the best ski hills in yeah. the world. Whistler Black. Uh, yeah. Like Lake Louise and all that, so people, everyone grew up skiing. You know, we we did not, but some of us chose to take to ski. Uh, but I was 
I'm sure I mentioned this before. I had to make a choice between ballet lessons or ski lessons. And I chose ballet. Wrong. Sounds like you chose wrong. You chose, you chose ballet. The, the, uh, the universal, you know, <laughs> grassroots, you know, uh, you know, really progressive world of, ba- of uh, ballet. My, classical yeah. Dance. Very inclusive. <laughs> my yeah. favorite That's thing, my word. favorite thing about like ballet culture is how like after recital, everybody goes back and like, to the to the house everybody's renting and sits by a fire and drinks and talks, talks about how about awesome the, dance. the ballet stuff was <laughs> and then the you know just all that oh wait no that's skiing that's what that's skiing key. is so but yeah. what is funny is that so I think the first time I went skiing I was fourteen and then I had a lot of catch up with because all my friends at that point were working as almost like um you know like working like as um ski medics and they were um, you know ski coaches ski on the ski patrolmen ski patrol that's it ski so medic. when you do when you do ballet you're always dealing with turning out your feet mm. but when you learn skiing it's all about turning right. in your feet that's so right. it was like the exact opposite of what my uh, body was trained to do so it was hard yeah i mean there's a big Same. rivalry between the innies and the outies <laughs> in, in, in school. Uh, is there any other sport <laughs> don't talk to her she's an innie <laughs> is is there is there any other sport or activity that gives you this a similar feeling, Christian, that kind of turns you off like right away? I know you're certainly not anti sport. You love NBA basketball, but but is there anything else like that? Because I feel the same way you do about about golf. No offense, folks. Lacrosse. I mean, a, a lot of it. I'm telling you, a, so much of it is just tied on to yeah. my tied into yeah. my absurd and indefensible jocks versus geeks sure. sort of, you know, pro- projection that I put on everything and not even jocks versus geeks, like jo- jocks versus art kids. Do you know what I mean? Like uh, to me, I always got mad and, you know, people always frame things as jocks versus nerds. No, it's always been jocks versus drama kids and nerds yeah. have been the swing group. They could go either way. And That's now nerds right. are skewing s- severely towards the right, but nerds could go either way. Oh, what that's... about uh, billiards? Ooh. <laughs> uh, I mean, billiards, no pool. Yes. Does that sound <laughs> OK? Right. Got it. Got I, had it. Ama- I had an amazing billiards moment this summer when I got together with 17 of my high school friends and rented a house for three nights. And a couple of them were kind of Trumpers. Nobody really said anything the whole weekend. And then on the last shot where I was about to win last ball, my buddy gets in my ears and goes, Trump MAGA forever. And I look at him, I close my eyes and do a look away, called it in the corner pocket. It might have been the greatest moment of my life. (laughs) What inspired him to say that to you? He was trying to get in my head, so I'd missed the shot. And he knows. What what, what about you made him know that that would get in your head? Because he knows. He knows. He's clearly a listener. It's general vibe. Pizza, pizza. Pizza, big name. He's because he was wearing his pussy hat at the time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> he's always wearing his pussy hat, isn't he? <laughs> always am. So, uh, uh, let me ask you guys this. Um, speaking of sports, did you do anything uh, or have any reaction to the the Super Bowl this week? Was there any? Uh, s- did you watch it? Did you care? What did you make of the controversy over the thing with the stuff? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure which thing or well, stuff. you had the halftime thing. Um, where you could talk about Eminem taking a knee, and you could also talk about the body shaming of 50 Cent, who seems like a really great guy, as far as I can tell. Yeah, I mean, the 50 Cent thing, of course I noticed. It just, that compression t-shirt was working overtime, which, uh, you know, (laughs) far be it from me to uh, cast aspersions on anyone for wearing a compression t-shirt. Lord knows I haven't been on camera in the last 10 years without one. But uh, I I thought it was kind of, boring honestly i know a lot of people really thought it was wonderful i thought mary j blige was great and i thought kendrick lamar was great but everybody else just it it kind of seemed like a you know it was like an oldies tour which is fine because hip-hop deserves that that's that shows the maturation of the hip-hop culture that they can be corny and lame and passe now too i think that's a sign of progress uh ophira i mean i like that everyone just doubled Oh, yeah. I just love that everyone doubled down on the age thing. Like everyone who was of a certain age was like, well, that was this one was for us. And then everyone that was younger that was like, boo. Uh, And I, you know, I feel as someone of a certain age, of course, like the very generic kind of stereotypical feeling that like, why is everyone younger so hell bent on always mentioning what is for their age or not? Because I think I also grew up in an era where I didn't think I wanted to be older. I was always like, I hope everyone thinks I'm your age Mm -hmm. instead of doubling down on my age. But then I was like, it must suck so hard 
to be in your 20s and maybe even early 30s right now, that all you have is your age. Yeah, you have to gatekeep your own <laughs> lives. You know, yeah. I, I also have a theory about this. I think it's because we are all immersed in multi generational cultures all the time now in a way that people mm. didn't used to be. Do you know what I mean? Like, like uh, there's no reason I should know who 22 year olds like. There's no reason yeah, I should right. know that. And there's no reason they should know who the hell, you know, whatever that, that, you know, that, that the replacements are going to do a reunion tour or whatever the five years ago or whatever, you, you know what I mean? Like there's no reason that we should be up in each other's shit the way we are now. And yeah, that, that I know. is crazy making. Yeah. We should be running around being like, I hope you enjoy your schmitzschmuck dances or exactly. whatever you call it. Yes. <laughs> but I, uh, I was in Cincinnati. I flew back home from Cincinnati on Saturday. So I flew on a flight from Cincinnati to New York because I was doing Brag. a couple of moss shows in Cincinnati. So I was there, uh, you know, while everyone was just going like there was oh, such you a were in, you were in the city oh, where okay. the Bengals are from. God, the Bengals, yeah. of course, in the Super Bowl. And you were in Cincinnati during the Super Bowl, which was in L.A. Right before. And- yeah, right, right before uh. I, I flew. Back on Saturday, so I was in New York on Sunday. But uh, so everyone was in such a good mood, and everything was decorated everywhere, and every, everybody was wearing all their orange and black jerseys and gear and whatever. So there was such a electricity in that city uh, that I think does not usually exist. And so I, of course, became sympathetic, and I wanted Cincinnati to win because I was like, oh, those people. I want them to be happy. And when I flew home to New York on a plane, who was flying from Cincinnati to New York on Saturday? I'll tell you, nine people. Oh, wow. <laughs> like, that was not a popular round. <laughs> I think I feel like it's easy. I, I, I understand what you're saying. You're, you're an empath like that. I like that. But I do. I, I think it would be it, for me, it's harder to root for like the Ohio teams, including Cincinnati, because of all of the people I've met from Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. counterpoint uh yeah well um, yeah i mean but i i feel the way about it, it kind of similar like i i have a hard time rooting for the united states in the olympics sometimes <gasps> which sounds weird but I, not that i root against america or anything like that but it's just that i know it doesn't mean as much to us as it does to other countries and right. so you know, like when when an American, you know, hey, we won the uh, the you know whatever the slalom, and people are like, yeah, USA, USA, and then three minutes later, it's like, what's for dinner? And then that's it. You know what yeah. I mean? Whereas this fucking Estonian, if they were to win, that's you know that's joy brought to a nation of people and pride, and you, you know what I mean? It's it's so that's why you know I remember like when the I think the USA baseball team you know was going up against the juggernaut Cuban national team, I'm like. Come on, can can we not? Can we not? Like Cuba, Cuba, Cuba has four hundred and nine citizens. Can we not treat them as if like they're the the Soviet Union and we're like this plucky understudy? You know, uh, right? Anyway, but that's sort of the way I feel about about Cincinnati and L.A. It's like I didn't have any stake in the game at all, but I know that it would have meant a lot more to Cincinnati than it will to L.A. Who's promptly forgotten about it? Oh, by well, the way, that's what I, that's what I thought too. I was like, L.A. is going to be like who? What? Was yeah. it about, was I in the Super Bowl? Then I don't care. Back to the body shaming jokes about 50 Cent. My favorite one. <laughs> oh, yeah. Was 50 Cent. It's actually 65 cents now. 50, I thought it was a dollar. 50 Cent <laughs> looks like a dollar was. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Good. Sorry. I, uh, I, I undercut the joke. I and that. then I made it worse. Yeah. So, uh, so we, uh, fine. Did we. Uh, did Thanks, we, Joe how, Biden. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Ophira, what are you going to do about the, the convoys that are shutting your homeland down? I have wanted okay. to, been looking for someone to blame and we have you here. Good. You know, so I think this is a good, this is helpful. I mean, the convoys are not helpful. You know, what's helpful mm. having Americans realize that even in Canada, it's not a homogeneous mindset. You know, everyone's like, oh, what? Yeah. There's right wing people in Canada. Yes. Yes, there's right-wing people in Canada. Although my sister 
uh, who lives in Canada and she um, is not right wing. When I was like, what is going on with the convoy? She wrote promptly back that she was like, you know, they're really all the people are American. (laughs) That's what she said. That's what she said. I was like, I don't think so. She was like, yeah, they're all American. If you really like dive into it, those aren't Canadians. So this is like when the Trump people blame <laughs> January 6th on Antifa. Right. Is that like they're all. <laughs> yeah, but I do. I do. Um, so it's, you know, on one hand. Uh, right. It's just like wild making. I totally see it coming. I have conservative family. They totally support this. They've been up in arms the whole time. They hate the lockdowns. Quebec and Toronto have been more locked down recently than we have. And you know what January felt like here and nothing closed. It felt devastating. People, we were all breaking apart. So I am not sympathetic to this convoy, but I do understand that people are losing it in a way that we didn't anticipate, even Canadians. Like they just can't do it anymore. It's unfortunate that it has to all get whatever people are feeling about um, lockdowns and quarantines and their own way to be able to make a living, just everything has to get shoved together with racism and right-wing politics and anti-vaxxing. Like it just, it all gets rolled together. Yeah. And you know, obviously it's a, it's a, it's a moving situation. It's hard to know what the future is going to bring. And it's hindsight is 2020 as many cliches as you want to string along, but I am very angry and disappointed at the uh, policymakers on the, you know, the, the well-intentioned good faith policymakers, the, the CDCs of the world, the Fauci's of the world or whatever for not providing clarity and metrics about what success looks like and what, you know, you know, they say, oh, we're not allowed to, you know, we shouldn't open things up again or, you know, not that everything's been closed, but you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you know, we should get back to normal and say, like, no, we're not ready. The numbers are still high. Okay. But what is the number then? What is the number? Like what, right. what is the target here? What is, you know, let's nail it down. What is, you know, everybody talks about uh, there's trade-offs and we have to find, we have to weigh, you know, sanity and commerce and society versus public safety. Let's nail that down. <laughs> so at least say it out loud. So that we have some that people like me who are much more ideologically inclined to uh, to give the benefit of the doubt to policymakers at least have some sort of light at the end of the tunnel so that the only people so that it's not the right wing fucking idiots or the deniers are not the only ones providing tactile solutions (laughs) solutions <laughs> so you know? you know and to that point so i i go to cincinnati i go to check into the hotel and uh i have my mask on as i walk in and i'm like what are ohio's i don't know how what, what ohio's specific um take on all of this is but i walk in and it's a hotel that is trying to be a little groovy so their check-in is a circle in the middle that's where their reception and check-in is and the people are not wearing masks and i'm like oh there must be a plexiglass ring around that and as i get closer there is not and so i'm just like oh what are we doing and then they explain to me as they're checking me in that there is gonna there's no housekeeping service but if i need anything let them know and i say why is there no housekeeping service and the woman goes covid and i go but no masks yeah so no housekeeping because of covid but no masks because no COVID. So what is it? Bullshit. Yeah, I know. And so many companies say- have done that. They've used COVID as an excuse to just cut back and yeah. just cut fringe benefits. Yeah. And, and I don't you know. think oh, I don't think Ophira said anything. <laughs> I think you think she just thought this. She imagined this conversation. No, I, like think, she- I think she said she's like, so why no housekeeping? The woman's like COVID. And Ophira's telling us, she said, yeah, but no masks. But I don't think she did say that. I did say that. I said no masks. And she said, she said, it's uh, not mandated. That's what she said. It's not mandated. Yeah. Well, neither is, neither is getting rid of your housekeeping. Yeah. She said, and then she said, well, we got corporate said no housekeeping. I have, we said corporate as like that so often. I feel like that is something (laughs) I used to hear like in movies that we had a, yeah. And it used to be like they'd be the villains, like the clear cut <laughs> villains. Well, yeah. it makes more sense now that it's gotten down to the rank. If everything seems to be so consolidated and corporatized, it would make sense for somebody. You're so far away from the decision maker there in Cincinnati. There's some guy at a sky rise in New York that's deciding policy on the Hampton Inns, which I'm guessing is what you stayed at. 
<laughs> and, uh, you know, then they're just. I don't know if they're in Hampton and Cincinnati, but you're close. <laughs> corporate. Corporate has decided corporate. on that. Ma- I mean, the schools are. I went to the BOME meeting last week was not. They had a 13 year old kid went up and it's like, I can't. I'm breathing my own poison. You must remove the mask. And the board's like, it's the state. You can keep coming and complain. People are nuts, though, with, with the schools, mm-hmm. which. I don't know. I, I, everybody to eat their own, but my daughters, uh, my daughters are like nobody really wears their mask, and it's not that big a deal. But you know, they're they're teenagers. I I, I realize well, it's and, harder. And I'm not the I'm not the first or fiftieth or five thousandth person to make this point, but it's like you know the the uh, you know masks obviously stop kids from learning, which explains why Asian students do so poorly, uh, having worn <laughs> masks intermittently for the past twenty years. <laughs> you know, right. and why is that thirteen-year-old breathing out poison? What's wrong with her? What's coming out of her? Yeah. That, you know, poison? change your diet. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> go to a dentist. It's so it's tough. It's <laughs> tough. It's tough seeing these young kids. By the way, go up to microphones at meetings or do activism because you know I I kind of want my daughters to to speak up too, but I always feel like it's super weird if it came from me. Uh, if I wrote it, if I told them what to say, and this kid was. Really bad, and he kept losing his place, and it was it was very, it was really cringy and embarrassing, and I felt real bad that he'd been kind of victimized by his own parents. But what do I know? The, the I mean, uh, I feel the same way, honestly. When you know, you see kids at the Earth Day rallies, and yeah. and they're holding yeah. up the sign about like save my future. It's like, yeah, I'm sure this was your thought, seven year old. I'm sure you're really thinking like, oh God, somebody's got to we got to do cap and trade. No, yeah. I mean, I think it's it's part of. It's part of school curriculum. I mean, there's like an aspect of that where they're like, all right, everybody, now we're going to make our save the planet signs. Right. Also, yeah. somebody's I mean, really against cap away. and trade over here. <laughs> it's, a, it's a challenging tax policy. I'm not sure that in the end it would benefit the planet or the economy, but I think to be so against it. So, you know, there's a whole uh, there's a whole line of thinking. There's sort of in the in the uh, hipster media that I read. That's what I'll call it. The hipster <laughs> media that I read. Uh, you know, they they're they're talking about what <laughs> this is so hilarious, but a vibe shift that's coming. Oh, up. yes. I, the big, big in the discourse yesterday at the vibe shift. Wait, yeah, did what? you read about the vibe shift? What I read about. Yes, I actually did read some of the article. Yeah. 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 About the vibe shift. Like, we don't know exactly where things are going, but, you know, with the idea that the pandemic is over, that's like the premise of this, by the way, is that the vibe shift is with the idea that that the pandemic has resolved itself, (laughs) that uh, we don't know what we're going into next. There's been so much disruption uh, between people moving away and um, offices closing and health being seen differently and people's opinions and that we're in for a vibe shift. I mean, does it mean bell bottoms are back? Well, how, what are the consequences here? Well, I mean, it could be a number of things. I mean, you know, th- these things happen. There's a reason why the Roaring Twenties are considered the Roaring Twenties. And there's a reason why the Thirties, I mean, the, obviously the Depression happened, which is what made the Thirties the Thirties. But, you know, there is also some sort of mass psychology that happens. And I, I think generally it's really a shift among about 10% of people. And then 90% of the people just kind of go along because, you know, I'm not like I'm not setting the fashion trends, but it definitely trickles down to me. Uh, you know, the famous Ma, Meryl Streep's famous monologue in The Devil Wears Prada uh, about the blue sweaters. Uh, I don't know why I'm bringing I love this. <laughs> or the I love belt, this. Or the belt. Yeah, but but that it starts it starts among the quote unquote elite, but then it yeah. trickles down into the culture. Um, right. But yeah, I mean, I think that actually would, trickles down. Yeah, it would be absurd if there wasn't a vibe shift. I think some of it is kind of what you're talking about, Peter. You know, just this that we're all going crazy, and that that it's it's yet to be determined what direction this craziness is going to go. Yeah, I was thinking how sad contemporary art will be <laughs> from this time, because, you know, there there was and it's I mean, it should have happened uh, other than I guess, you know, there was uh, some of the contemporary art from this time will be seen in terms of um, protest signs. But the rest of the contemporary art is going to be like live, love, laugh on reclaimed wood. I mean, that's really <laughs> there. The, the art that came out of this was m- pointless. Very bad. Very bad art. Yeah, very bad. Um, yeah. It, it all in all genres. I think so. 
<laughs> was there no good music? I like you thought about it. You're like, yes. Have yes, you seen that? What, so. what about uh, what's his name? Stand up special. Oh, inside. I yeah. think that was no. Very... I think you meant Christian Finnegan. Oh yes, Christian Finnegan. <laughs> that was innovative. Uh, uh, yeah, I think inside was super innovative. I, I mean, I wonder. I think that guy is brilliant, and I think what's his the name? Greatest Bo Burnham. Bo Burnham. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I. Uh, but and it made spur a whole bunch of stand up specials like that. But I do think that was very specific. Like he was. He really. He did a. He did a lot with a very specific moment. I, it is going to be interesting to see what a not not that there is going to be such a thing as a quote unquote post COVID world because it's going to be endemic to a certain degree and it's not going to be like you know I think we all kind of had this fantasy in twenty twenty one that you know somebody was going to cut a piece of a ribbon and then all of a sudden it's like life is back to normal I think now we know that's not true but I, I certainly think that. Uh, just by virtue, not only of falling numbers, but also therapeutics. And also just like you said, the psychology of people just needing a different, you know, life, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see. And I, I think it's probably going to take a couple of years to shake out, you know, to see it's not all going to happen at once. It's not all going to happen for the same people, you know, at the same time. Totally. I mean, I think just people moving away, that's what I'm most interested in seeing if the idea of being in a location is important, that's, mm. I feel like that's one of the most important shifts that I want to know. Is it going to be like, people are going to flock back to like New York because their job is dependent on them being in New York. Or is it just going to be like, who cares? I feel mm -hmm. like it's got to be something about the adaptations and evolution of technology um, that has allowed people to work from home for the most part and for a lot of people, as well as a company's understanding about how much money they're saving and add in that people don't love commuting for the most part, that there will be a real permanence of a, a change in terms of how we work and it'll only become probably maybe less centralized and, and you'll be able to live more about where you want to live and the consequences of that in terms of uh, so many different things. It's I mean, I, I'm super worried about that in terms of uh, New York and cities yeah. in general, you know, and Eric Adams, when he made that speech where he talked about that, my dishwashers don't have the academic, whatever. I mean, he phrased it really poorly and it revealed kind of a, <laughs> it revealed what a kind of a, a dope he can be. But the general, if you listen to it in context, the full point he was talking about is that we, that these things exist in an ecosystem that when an office is closed, it's not just the office, it's the deli okay. on the corner where everyone gets their lunch. It's the, it's the newsstand. It's, it's, you know, and I do worry about that, uh, that that's going to all have to be, you know, uh, put back together in a different way. I'm not saying it can't, I'm not saying it just cause it used to be this way is the way it always has to be. Yep. Because at that point you're just trying to preserve something that's clearly on the path to dying. But I don't know what a post, I don't know what a work from home culture in cities looks like over a 10 year span. Well, I think our analysis of it just now is pretty, uh, accurate. Eric Adams says Cook's dishwashers, the mayor of New York, Cook's dishwashers don't have, quote, academic skills to sit in a corner office. Poorly, inartfully made point, but not untrue about the socioeconomics of of the situation that we're talking about. I guess. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it was a is a dumb point and kind of offensive in many ways. But that the point he was making is just that these people, there's a lot of people in the cities that aren't, you know, just making the decision to work from home or not. You know, they, right, a lot of right. people depend on people not working from home. Okay. And, to counter it and just be a little Pollyanna here, but what if it is a, just a shift in a different direction? So yes, the deli workers, like I remember when I used to work in Bryant park all the time and the food options around there. And you know, those people at those delis were making so much money with their salad bars or whatever, but it was, um, it was depressing what you, <laughs> what the options were, but I didn't want them to go to business. However, now my neighborhood, I feel like has more lunch options. My, because people are around. And so Perhaps, a few more restaurants yeah. are like, well, let's do lunch. Your neighborhood because being people, less, your neighborhood being a different, uh, not in a place where he had as many restaurants because there wasn't as many people working, more people living there. What am I, what are the words I'm trying to use? The type of neighborhood. Yeah, well, 
Yeah, it's like it's it's everyone used to leave during the day to yeah. go to their office job somewhere, and Got now it. they're not. So some restaurants around here, I mean, there used to be nowhere to go for lunch. Right. There was just mm-hmm. now there's. I like, would think there'd be food trucks everywhere for that reason, no? I mean, I think if any, I think there's enough double parking as it is. I don't know where they're. <laughs> how long? So much. How many days? <laughs> how many days could you work in a food truck? Oh, it's that's tough. I don't know. Me personally, um, I mean, yeah. Oh God, hours. I, I think I, I could be in a truck twenty four hours a day, three hundred sixty five days a year, but not if I actually have to like prepare food in it. Oh, <laughs> like the stress. I have never. I mean, I can't even imagine what it's like being a cook. But like, I have never in my life felt stress like I did when I used to wait tables. Oh, no, really? nothing in my life has ever been as stressful as that. Really? Like when you are in the weeds on a Saturday night, and oh, it's. I mean, I'm, it's been twenty five years. <laughs> I can and, see. Your eyes right now. Oh, You're God. not okay. I, I'm having PTSD in front of you. <laughs> what was the worst? Uh, what was the worst part of it? That and, there were eight things that had to be done, and you couldn't remember which order of things had to be done, and that people were angry at you all the time. <laughs> and I'm not good at you know uh, keeping five balls in the air mentally, <laughs> you know. And I, I just, I'm not psychologically. Uh, I was, I, I was a waiter, but I was a very bad waiter. Oh, and a very wow. bad bartender. Oh wow, that's that surprises oh. me, the the hell out of me. Oh god, it was the worst. Well, <laughs> do you, do you, <laughs> you still have dreams, don't you? Oh, absolutely. I like being a bartender when it was slow. Like I was good at like making cocktails. Like I could be yeah. one of those like dumb mixologist douchebags. But that like, <laughs> the, like people like where are my cosmos, please? Like that kind of shit. Yeah. You know, was ah. uh, uh, Ophira, same question for you. Worst job? Did you ever have a job that traumatized you like the way that Christian seems to? He's he's wow. He's getting up and leaving. He's on the <laughs> phone with a therapist. <laughs> Put down I the just gun. Him, like take like five but, pills. I just t- <laughs> drink a jar. Oh, it's just vitamin C. He's carrying a tray of empty glasses around his apartment. <laughs> what is he doing? Pacing around with it. I used to talk myself uh, in, I used to work in IT, but I was pretty low level and I was good at some of it, but I was always talking myself into that. I, I just always was claiming I knew more than I did. And I remember <laughs> the stress of that because I was going into companies, architecture firms, uh, PR companies, and they would be like, our servers are down. We have no email. And I'd be like, uh huh, you know, but trying to pretend I knew what I was doing. And I remember, I remember like, totally deleting someone's email box and just being like, what am I going to do about this? And just sweating it out. Just being like, what do I say? And like, just now working on trying to get back. And there are some things that, you know, I used to always try to impress upon people like, Oh, you can't break it. Don't worry about it. Don't be afraid of these things. And then I would just delete all their shit. I did not know what I was doing all the time. (laughs) <laughs> I remember once I in this is back. I, in the, I don't in know the, how to tell you this, but I um is this Bruce Ahern? Hi. Um I just deleted your email entirely. And so I'm gonna show myself out. Well, the great thing about it is that it's like generally I imagine the people that you're talking to in those situations know less than you. So you can kind of just blame it on like, oh, the the, the server backed up with the, you know, the uh, oh my God. With the DNS code or whatever. You know what I mean? <laughs> I would I would often be like, you know, when I was transferring the raid one to the raid two, you know, the DNS um, servers went down and, you know, that's a problem. So as I'm putting back together the IPs, you know, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to retrieve as much as I can. Uh, yeah. A load of horse shit. <laughs> yeah. Wow, I may also- have said this before. I feel like I may have, but I remember once when I was temping in the late nineties and I was temping for some uh, personal assistant who was in her probably mid to late fifties. And she'd been there for 30 years or something like that. And the guy I was uh, working for, he said, um, I need to send this letter to these 20 people. So, um, so I just need you to type up this letter to these 20 people. So that should probably take you like a day or two. Cause he had never known that there was such a thing as called a mail merge that you can just put the addresses in and then make, and this is back in the nineties, obviously it's even easier now, but you know, it would take like an hour maybe. Uh, and when I showed him that you could do this, it was like showing a caveman fire. (laughs) <laughs> and then I saw him realize that, oh my God, I have been lied to for the past. Cause I'm sure the woman I was replacing was like, yeah, that can't be done. That's going to take me all oh, week. Yeah. I got to type each letter oh, yeah. individually. Oh, and then I had no. ruined this woman's you life. screwed it. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, the worst is when you I had that happen. The opposite of that happened when I would be told by my producers, like, we can't do that. 
And then I would be like, have you tried shift K? Like, oh. <laughs> like, I'm sorry to call you out, but yeah, it's just you hold down shift and hit the letter K. I can't believe you told me you can't do a thing oh my gosh. that is two buttons yeah. long. So, you know, and I got to say, I, I've had to eat my own uh, humble pie, I guess it's called, because I have a very low tolerance for people who don't know what they're doing that are doing something. I'm just like, just admit that you don't know what you're doing so yeah. I can either take over or figure out someone else to do that thing. But I remember this computer IT firm that I worked for, you know, they hired a bunch of computer IT people that that's what they went to school in. That's what they were interested in. And they were so mean to me. And I was always like, why are they assholes? So why are they so mean? And now I like I was a tool. I was a I was dead weight at mm. that job. I was dead <laughs> weight. They didn't consider you one of the real ones because you didn't have a, a, a yeah. degree. Yeah, yeah, I did not have because you had social all. skills and I had social skills showered. People like talking to me. <laughs> yeah, that was the truth. <laughs> Invited to parties, you know. I don't like this person with a personality. I did get invited to parties. <laughs> oh, this is fun. This is fun. I enjoyed this. I'm looking at the clock. I've taken up enough of your time. I really appreciate you both. I miss talking to you. Uh, Sunday night, you guys are going to be together. I'm supposed to be with you. Uh, yes, you are. But I, uh, I'm doing the last week tonight, first episode, so I can't be with you. But then uh, future gigs, future gigs, and we gotta maybe circle back and start booking a few. I got a few ideas, and uh, but but we, we will announce. But see Christian and Ophira this weekend. I'm losing my plugs. Where is it? I haven't it's, seen uh, John Oliver's uh, show lately. Uh, is uh, how much uh, incredulous shouting is there this week? <laughs> Did you see? The, uh, he's the, very good. He's very good. You're the it's, best. The guy, oh, there's, there's a, there's a guy who, who bumped into him, a kid who bumped into John Oliver on the street in New York and he does an amazing John Oliver. So good. And he got Oliver to like stand over his shoulder and do a TikTok. It's kind of gone pretty big, oh, but he's really taking the piss out of him for that. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, I gotta find look that up. Good stuff. The show is at the Harbor Theater in yes. Stone Harbor, New Jersey, Sunday night at nine PM. You can go to souljoles.com. Thank you for doing the work for that tickets. we should be both be doing. Yes, there are tickets uh, available. Yes. And it's going to be so good because uh, we got rid of the the weakest element of the show. Yeah, so we can stretch and, uh, out. I <laughs> saw it. Comedy. I saw it. I thought you were going to end a little stronger, though. Um, I thought you, I would have said it's going to be really a lot better than, wife? Hey, than the last show because Pete won't be there. Just oh, really. We wish you were there. We do. It was so much fun. We just want to do more of that. And we will. But come yeah. to this one because Chris and I are going to eat up all of Pete's time. Yeah, yeah. That's right. And uh, good luck without me. <laughs> I think it's <laughs> Thank really, you. you guys are probably going to not do as good because of me. True. We'll have, we'll <laughs> so, have no one to feel better be, about. So, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. All right. There they go. Old Finnegan, Christian Finnegan, Ophira Eisenberg. See them this weekend and see us all together soon. We're doing an April date in New York State at the Howland Cultural Center in Beacon, New York. Saturday, April 2nd. That is Saturday, April 2nd in Beacon, New York. All right. That's it for the week. Thank you very much, Ruth ben Gia. Thank you to obviously Christian and Ophira. Thank you to you, most importantly, for listening and subscribing and allowing me to have these conversations that we all hope gain from each and every weekday. Tell your friends about it. Promote the show. Hang out with us on Thursday nights. I love you guys. Have a great weekend. Thank you so much for your support. I'll talk to you Monday right here on Stand Up. When you can't see the forest for the burning trees, you got to stand up. Hey, you've been sitting so long, you got the creepy knees, you got to stand up. Stand up. I think you're driving wheels in a leak in Greece. Boy, you better stand up. Stand up. Well, there's a whole lot more of us who know us right. They'll keep right on ignoring us if we keep in sight. You got to open up the window to let in some light. You got to stand up. That's right. You got to rise up. You got to stand up. You got to stare the devil straight in the eye. For your fence, even if it ain't a very friendly audience, but they'll begin to listen when you start 
making sense and you stand up. Stand off ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws and since they weren't even sin, they knew. Change was gonna come before the change would begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We gotta let him know it's his time to go to make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up stand All right, up. we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up, you got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no wanton tribe Rise up, show up to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide and say stand 